Hello, I'm Barrister Daniel Barnett and welcome to this video talking about hot issues in sports law in 2021. I'm joined today by Barrister Louis Weston of Outer Temple Chambers. Louis practices in sports law, he leads the sports law group at Outer Temple and he specialises both domestically within the UK and internationally in all sorts of sporting issues including horse riding, cricket, badminton, darts, snooker, greyhound racing, rugby and football. And Louis is also a member of the Football Association's Judicial Panel. We're going to discuss the following five issues. The impact of COVID-19, indirect consequences of COVID-19, safeguarding, inclusion and diversity, match fixing, corruption and doping, and concussion injuries. I've done several of these hot topic issues for different areas of law and everybody says that COVID is the number one hot topic in 2021. How is COVID affecting sports law in particular? The big thing in the last year is the attempt by those who run the sport and participate in it to keep matches and competitions going. And because it's pretty obvious and to anyone who looks at sport or knows how it works, that there are risks to players, there are risks to support staff, and there are risks to the ancillary staff. So the people who um, sell the tickets or clean up the stands or wash up the changing rooms after the match. There's been a huge bite on revenue, both to uh, players and participants through their income, competition organisers and competition hosts. So Covid has pretty obviously, in the same way that it's affected everyone's daily life, affected the life of organisers and participants in sport. Can you give some other examples, Louis? The big issue is running forward. We've got the Olympics 2020, which is going to take place in 2021, or not. Euro 2020 taking place in 2021, and a bit of a fight going on as to where the Lions Tour of South Africa is going to take place, if it's able to take place at all. Let's talk about the Olympics in Tokyo. Can you explain what's going to be happening there, what you think is likely to happen, and what the legal issues arising from the Olympics are likely to be? It's very difficult to judge, but the factors that are playing on people's minds are broadly these. The Olympics is a massive event. Um, going back to Rio, 10,500 athletes uh, went into Rio as participants. And so with them, you'd have thirty to 40,000 people in total of support staff, trainers and the like. On top of that, you've got TV, radio, journalists from around the world so you're looking at an international influx into one country, one city, of around about 100,000 people. And the big question is, how do you keep them safe? And is it possible to keep them safe in a city itself that's struggling with COVID and is having its health services overwhelmed by the number of cases in Japan at present? What's your view on that, Louis? Is it safe or legal to either send athletes or vaccinate athletes? It, it, the law is what you make it. It's, it's legal to go there if the local government allows it. Uh, and as long as they have an immigration system that doesn't bar people coming in at risk of COVID, they'll come in. But one, one of the concerns, it's more of an ethical question, I think, at the moment than a legal question, is, is it uh, reasonable of, a, say, an English team to send its participants and expose them to the risk of mixing with so many people in a city? And are they at risk of uh, litigation if they do so? A simple answer might be to say, well, let's vaccinate all of the athletes and all of the support staff. But if you're looking at a situation where in each country you're prioritising relatively young and obviously uh, fit people over elderly people or those who are in world accepted vulnerable groups, people who are in those vulnerable groups might reasonably ask, why are we being put back and put at risk of death so that a young fit person can go and participate in a sporting event? If either the City of Tokyo or the International Olympic Committee decide to cancel or again postpone the Games, what legal ramifications do you think that will have? The understanding is, and you'll appreciate that not all documents are in the public domain, but the understanding is that the host city takes on the obligation of underwriting the Games. And the Olympics is not only a great sporting triumph, it's a great commercial triumph. You have sponsors uh, pay lots of money to get their names and brands in front of people during um, the Games. You have uh, TV shows and a month of the BBC explaining to people uh, what happens in the sport of archery um, they've never heard of before. 
And they've paid a great deal of money for that. And if the IOC lose out on that, they are likely to turn to Tokyo. And no recent games has uh, made a profit in any reasonable way of accounting for it by hosting the games. And if Tokyo hosts the games that is desperately unsuccessful because it can't sell any tickets and because some of the uh, events are cancelled, so there's issues with the sponsors, there's issue with the TV rights, the city of Tokyo is going to be on the hook for a great deal of money. Let's move away from the Olympics and look at rugby. What are the big threats and the legal issues in the coming year for rugby? Coming up, you've got uh, more tournaments. Uh, You've got the uh, domestic tournaments, you've got the cross-European tournaments, you have the tournaments in the Six Nations. And the problem, again, is how do you keep a team moving around, either within a country or across borders, safe? In the last six months, rugby has been kept going but had to take a um, circuit break. Uh, because the number of COVID cases became too high. And you also have um, some political considerations. So just coming up to this tournament, um, the Six Nations, the French were expressing at least concern, or reported as expressing concern, about having their team and uh, teams coming across their borders when there is still a high risk of COVID and of the uh, particular variants. Uh, that crop up in particular countries. And so the problem in sport is, if you end up with a tournament that doesn't run its term or doesn't run in the way that people anticipate, the people who've paid lots of money for their sponsorship or their TV rights and the people who've paid tickets to uh, watch it in principle are put out of their money and they threaten litigation. Let's turn to discuss the indirect consequences of COVID-19. What is the number one indirect consequence in your view, Louis Weston? So you you, you looked at the major effects, headline effects on the big tournaments and behind the big tournaments you have bigger consequences I think that are hidden and won't come out for some time. Um, Firstly you've got women's and youth sport which isn't suffering postponement, it's suffering cancellation and complete loss of coverage. You've then got the effects on the players and the participants. Over the summer you had a large number of England cricketers who were being locked down and kept in hotels for a couple of months. You have rugby players who are being locked down and kept in a tight sphere for a couple of months. That is an issue that is of concern for them. Not only the question of are they physically safe if they go on tour to a foreign country, but is it safe uh, for a human being, a a young athlete, in the same way as it's a question for people who go to university, to be completely locked down without the ability to go out, talk to their friends. And the stress and strains that puts on someone is not something I think that's immediately and obviously apparent. If we're looking at UK law, what legal issues might arise as a result of locking down the athletes. Well, if the athletes contract the, the illness whilst they're in the care and custody, uh, literally the custody in a sense, of the sport that controls them, the people who put them there have a duty to keep them safe. And if they don't enforce properly the biosecurity that is supposed to keep the athletes safe, and they're negligent in doing so, they're at risk of litigation. Also, it appears to me pretty obvious that there's a foreseeable risk that there will be mental and psychological consequences, and they need to put in place, and if they don't put in place, uh, I'm sure at the moment the England team uh, on tour in um, Sri Lanka and off to India have got, I know that they do uh, from reports, they've got uh, people who will counsel either in person or by telephone and look after the mental safety of those participants. But you shift away from that to a sport that hasn't got as much money or isn't quite so high profile and they won't be able and are at risk if they don't to bid in place such good measures. Well, from what you're saying, that's clearly going to be a loss of revenue for the club. What do you think the clubs are going to do? What steps can they take to try to increase their revenue? The loss of revenue, I think, breaks down in two ways. First, first you have the immediate loss of revenue. So no one has been going to watch their local club on a Saturday afternoon in football or rugby. And over the summer, they didn't go to cricket. But on a more permanent basis, there's a, a very substantial risk to sport that will people want to go back? Will people feel comfortable for this year, next year, if they can, to be in a crowded terrace? Have people now lost the bug of going to a match on a Saturday afternoon or a uh, 
a night match in the summer in cricket and how many people have actually lost catching the bug there's a whole year without sport and you know, every year someone will go for the first time and in that year now a lot of people who would have gone haven't and will never catch the bug so I think most sports are working and realize that this is a five-year recovery plan it's not a quick thing it's not going to bounce back we're not all going to immediately fill the tills of the sport as we go along and that loss of revenue is going to be hit much harder and much more difficult to recover in the lower leagues women's sport uh, and para sport and I I see that there will be a real drive to get people back to the terraces back to Cheltenham back to the major uh, cricket events the major sporting events in this country. Do you think there's likely to be an increase in litigation between clubs? When the start of the COVID crisis came about, there was, as with any interesting development in the real world, a great flurry of excitement amongst lawyers as to what litigation could be developed and what litigation could be focused. And a lot of lawyers spent a lot of time writing articles on frustration, force majeure and issues of that sort. And claims were brought against the regulators, uh, in the sport of football at least, as to whether or not it was fair and reasonable to suspend the season, and if they did suspend the season, to allow uh, clubs to avoid the consequences of promotion and relegation. Those threats appear, at least at the moment, not to have developed into wholesale litigation, because those cases that have gone forward and have been published, at least in football, demonstrate that the flexibility of the rules allows most people to take a reasonable course uh, in the circumstances of the COVID crisis. And I I rather hope that litigation will be avoided because this is very much a situation where everyone is in it together. But the problem will come when you have a a concern in a particular sport, whether the uh, season has been suspended and the clubs that would expect to come back up, particularly say in rugby where Saracens are in the lower divisions and now won't be able to, whether they will be keen to bring a claim or whether the club system has to be restructured to make more people in the top tier where all the money is. Let's turn to safeguarding, which also covers issues such as inclusion and diversity. Can you explain what the legal issues are at the moment in sport concerning safeguarding? The issue is is really this, that I've spent the last part of our conversation dealing with COVID. Behind COVID, are a great number of issues that simply have not been getting the coverage that they deserve or were getting before COVID arose because the bandwidth just isn't there. And so these issues are still there and are, are falling a bit by the wayside. The uh, first one I'll talk about is, is safeguarding. There are a number of reviews that have been taking place. There's Clive Sheldon's review, uh, Clive Sheldon's QC review into sex abuse in football has not reported. There are sex abuse cases going through the courts with my colleague James Council, Queen's Council, having done a a series of those. And a number of sports have uh, carried out investigations and published reports. Chris Quinlan QC has done two, one in tennis and one in athletics. Uh, And there's an ongoing one in gymnastics with Anne White QC um, that started off in December. But those uh, are not attracting the publicity that they deserve. And because they don't get the publicity they deserve, the issue of safeguarding, protecting people in vulnerable circumstances in sport is not getting the attention it deserves. And I feel it has been put back the momentum that was there by at least a year, maybe two or three. Does that open sports organisers or sports participants up to any particular legal consequences? The issue, as you well know in all claims, is to establish that someone knew there's a problem and didn't do something about it. And if these reports have been incapable of being actioned because the sports don't have the revenue or they don't have the publicity and sports that weren't themselves rich enough to carry out the level of investigation that the richer sports did haven't had the time or the capacity to learn the lessons from bigger sports and they're vulnerable to complaints but Fundamentally, this is not a legal problem. Um, As with most issues in law, law deals with the outcome of problems. Uh, of more pressing concern is that safeguarding must be put in place so that there isn't the problem day in, day out. Uh, There's a piece in the paper today on the news that uh, women athletes are being harassed as they run along the streets. It's outrageous. And it needs to be tackled and it needs both government and the sports themselves to act on those reports that have been underway in the last couple of years. 
Louis Weston, the fourth issue I'd like to discuss with you is about match fixing and corruption. Just before I do, if you're enjoying this video or finding it helpful, please do click on the like button underneath. Uh, that shows your appreciation for Louis giving up his time for recording this video. Uh, and it also helps the YouTube algorithm realize that this is a video that might be interesting to other people, so it'll get served up for other people. Also have a think about subscribing to this uh, channel. I have a YouTube channel, which you can just click the subscribe button for which has legal explainer videos on all different areas of law, employment, family, crime, hot issues for different years, uh, careers if you're thinking of becoming a lawyer. There's a whole range of subjects there. Just subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell to get a notification whenever I upload a new video, typically twice a week. Louis Weston, I'm sorry, I, I was talking to you about match fixing and corruption. What are the issues? No one wants their child to go into a sport where the outcome of the competition is not one that's uh, determined by skill or athleticism, but instead by a fix-up between the participant and the bookmaker. And corruption in sport has been a real, real problem in the last 10, 15 years, and it's occupied a great deal of my practice. But in the circumstances of COVID, there have been uh, particular problems. Um, the first problem is ghost matches, which may not be familiar to all of your listeners and viewers. Uh, but a ghost match is a, a, an event which is staged virtually and doesn't really take place. So in, in March 2020, there was a competition uh, publicised called the Azov Cup, um, the Russian area. I can't remember if it's Russia or Ukraine. And the, the Azov Cup was a, um, designed to be a competition in a particular sport that created sporting outcomes and therefore allowed people to bet on it. But the Azov Cup didn't actually take place. It was a complete fiction. No sporting uh, competition took place, and rather like the scene in The Sting, you know, the results came out, but nothing was actually happening. The people who made the money out of it were the people who pretended that the tournament was taking place because they were able to determine the outcome of all the matches because they didn't take place. And that's the sophistication and level of corruption uh, that has taken place uh, whilst people have been in lockdown. What about the impact of COVID on the ability to carry out full investigations? It's been very hard. A number of cases that I've been involved with involve interviewing players and participants to try and find out why it is that they became involved in certain activity or what their level of knowledge and involvement was. And it's immensely difficult to conduct a proper investigation when you can't fly into a particular country, you can't meet in a particular country, and you can't interview someone. And unlike the police uh, and federal authorities who have the power of compulsion that they can arrest people, those who invest, investigate sporting corruption and the involvement in match fixing and the like don't have the power of arrest and compulsion. So a number of investigations have been on hold. It's very difficult, as you will realise, to conduct a proper investigation by Zoom. It's difficult to have a look at real documents in order to investigate data that a particular participant may have physically. And it also has meant that a number of cases have been put on hold, although lawyers, conservative though they are, have been learning that there is Zoom and Teams as a way of doing inquiries. Is there any current legislation in the United Kingdom about match fixing and is it effective if there is any legislation? There's a series of international treaties, the Mackinac Convention and the United Nations treaties, that have all set out a system of model laws as to how to criminalise and deal with match fixing. And the UK as a, a nation state has signed up to these treaties, but we do not in this country have any detailed or effective legislation uh, that addresses match fixing. We have the Gambling Act and we have some old offences of uh, conspiracy to defraud or corruption type offences, but none of them actually deal with the model law of saying to a particular participant, if you try and manipulate the outcome in a particular match, you are in breach of the criminal law. And that exposes sport, I think, to the involvement of criminals who would much rather run the risk of not being caught in fixing a football match or fixing uh, an outcome in a particular sport than they would doing 25 years in Chokey uh, for bringing a load of cocaine into the country. Um, that's the problem, and the DCMS really ought to grasp and put in place uh, proper laws to combat the problem. Is the use of illicit substances, or, or doping as it's known, still something that's prevalent in 2021? It's an Olympic year, so doping will come to the fore. 
and it's come to the fore really um, over the last years because of the film Icarus or the facts behind the film Icarus and the difficulties that uh, Rusada, the Russian anti-doping agency uh, that is uh, thought found to have engaged in systematic uh, doping offences and has led to a whole chain of uh, litigation in the sports world in which the current outcome is that Rusada and Russian athletes are banned for two years. Uh, what's interesting, I think, and, and coming forwards is uh, a very bold step by uh, the Americans who brought into force on the 7th of December 2020 the Rodchenkov Act, which gives to America a worldwide jurisdiction to criminalise the activities of anyone who involves themselves in match fixing through doping or doping corruption in sport. But because it's an Olympic year, there will be a mass of high profile cases uh, because um, the impetus to win is huge and human nature is to cheat either of your own volition or because your team wants you to. One case that's really caught my attention recently is the prosecution of Jason Service in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about that? Doping and anti-doping and corruption tends to focus on uh, human beings, but it's also a fairly big thing in the world of uh, animal sport. And a big case coming up in the United States is the prosecution of the uh, famous horse trainer there, Jason Service who, uh, along with 27 others, they don't hang around when they bring a case in America, uh, is charged with uh, doping of horses on a fairly mammoth basis, including uh, a horse called Maximum Security that uh, last year crossed the line first, whether it won or not is an issue that's going to be decided. Um, the Saudi Cup, which is a horse race in um, Saudi Arabia, uh, excellent reputation, excellently uh, regulated, and the prize for it was 10 million. But because the suggestion in the American litigation is that Jason Service had been doping its horses, uh, the Saudi Jockey Club has withheld the prize money from the owners. And there is uh, both the litigation in America, which will come to a conclusion, one hopes, this year, but also uh, a domestic investigation in Saudi as to whether uh, the prize money should go to the horse. And I think sport recognises that where there's a suggestion of doping, it's sensible to take a cautionary approach to the payout of prize money, certainly at that level. The final issue I'd like to discuss, Louis Weston, is the problem of physical injuries and in particular concussion injuries in sports. Now, concussion injuries have been around a very, very long time, but they seem to be re-emerging as a focus for litigation. Can you explain how concussion injury litigation works, what it's about, what the current hot issues are, please? A view that uh, either heading a football or being hit by a boxer or banging your head in a rugby game will cause you... Uh, injury has been known for very many years but it, in the last six months it's come to its fore with the death of uh, a number of uh, the participants in the 1966 World Cup win and also in rugby where group claim litigation is threatened against the regulators perhaps the clubs and perhaps their staff as a result of the exposure of rugby players to head injury and the headline position and it's not yet gone to court in this country there's been settlements in America and in other jurisdictions particularly in the sport of American football the headline issue is whether or not the sport has taken proper care for those people who have played in the sport and whether the clubs have allowed uh, their players to play when they shouldn't and whether or not the sports and the clubs and the medical staff have put in place uh, proper and safe assessments for the risks of head injury. So it's concussion and permanent brain damage as a result. It's not, though, straightforward by any means. The key problems, I expect, are going to be on what lawyers would call causation. Barbara Windsor, who on the face of it uh, didn't uh, involve herself in sport, died very sadly of uh, dementia. Many people do. It's a top killer now in this country. And proving that it was the sport that caused the dementia as opposed to a problem native to the person because of their genetic makeup that caused their dementia is very difficult and may at the moment in medical science not be capable of being proved until after death, which uh, is a very unattractive prospect. What damages will flow? How do you calculate compensation if it can be shown that a concussion injury has led to a subtle long-term brain injury? 
Well, there's two broad headlines. The first is some compensation for the physical uh, inconvenience, pain and suffering that you receive as a result of suffering that condition. But second, it's financial compensation either uh, to compensate you for the care that you might need in later life where you're no longer able to care for yourself or the loss of earnings that you will have received because you can't perform as well as you would have done but for the injury. But again, my view on this, I'm afraid, is, is rather brutal as against lawyers. Some sports are rich and some are not, um, but it's not beyond the wit of man um, to put in place a scheme or a tariff in sport um, where there is a fund that um, people, not just the high-profile celebrities, but those who play in lower leagues, those who play in, in amateur level, uh, can draw on that fund uh, rather than be forced into uh, litigation. Thank you very much, Louis Weston from Outer Temple Chambers. If you want to get in touch with Louis, there are details in the notes below. You might also want to have a look at some of the other videos on this site. I have a whole host of videos on employment law, on crime, on family, and one of my favourite recent videos is just here. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Barrister Daniel Barnett. Bye-bye.